Hello and welcome to the Insider at Home, the show that brings you the best in show jumping. My guest for today is a 10-time American Rider of the Year. She has won nearly 250 Grand Prix. Her achievements and her experience in our sport are unparalleled. She takes her work ethic and her sport very serious, but she doesn't take herself always that serious. Though she's always in for a joke, you don't mess around with her when she's around the poker table. Here she is, the one and only Margie Engel. Great to have you with us. Great to be here, Frederick. How are you doing, Margie? Okay, so far. Uh, tell me, where where do we find you? Where where are we holding this inside at home? Where are you? I'm still in Wellington, Florida. We're still, actually, we just started competing in some schooling shows last week. And they did a great job. It was over at Global. It's a, it's a different world out there. We're all wearing masks and don't know who anybody is. <laughs> and uh, gloves. And But uh, it, it's interesting and everyone's working hard at it. It's very warm down here. Uh, South Florida, the humidity is it's like you're walking in a sauna, but but we're at least out there and we're able to do what we love doing. Well, that's the most important. Uh, I, I hear you say it's it's hard work. Um, I, I've been through your biographies. Um, it was hard work for you to start um, your horse riding career, not, not only competing, just the horse riding. Um, you had to put in a lot of effort uh, to get your first ride, actually. How did your career start or how did your riding start? Actually, I... A friend of mine from grade school, she was my best friend in first grade, second grade, uh, when I was like six, seven years old. She had a horse out at the stable. At Glade, it was called Gladewinds Farm. And it was a riding school and they had a dog and a cat kennel. And I was like eight or nine years old and I was begging my parents to be able to ride. And I, my family is non-horsey. It, it's, they didn't understand the riding and they thought I was too small and I was going to get hurt. I've always been a little bit of a daredevil that I, I like doing things with animals and I like sports and it just seemed like a great combination. So the Kramers, I begged them all the time for if I could earn something around the barn. I wanted to work with the horses and groom, but I, they said I was too small. So I worked in the dog. They had a dog and a cat kennel. So I started off working in a dog and cat kennel in exchange for riding lessons. And, and you had pleasure rides with the horses and everything. And I didn't really think of it as work. I, I love working with the, I loved animals. So in the cat kennels, that was easy because cats go in a little box, <laughs> have a litter box. So that was quite easy. The dog kennels were not quite as nice. The dog kennels, they're very messy and, and uh, that was difficult to clean out. My parents paid for one lesson a week. And then if I wanted to ride more, because it was, it's, you know, it's ex expensive sport. And uh, I had a choice of either continuing my guitar playing or lessons or or doing the, the riding and I did the riding and the Kramers let me work in exchange for, for rides and I loved it and then I would beg to be able to groom the horses and when I got to about 10 then they let me start working around the barn and my parents were laughing at the time that they said you know you were all excited you came home and said oh they let me clean the horses stalls out <laughs> I was so excited that I got to clean the horses stalls instead of the the dog and cat kennels uh, but they're much cleaner and don't smell as bad as the, the dogs. <laughs> I imagine. Oh, Margie, uh, when you started riding, did you straight away have talent? I don't know. It's hard to say about yourself, but I was gutsy. And I, yeah. I loved the challenge. The The ponies I liked were the more difficult ones, the ones that were, uh, Mrs. Kramer would want me to write the nicer ones, but I, I didn't want to ride the ones that everybody liked. I wanted the difficult ones that were a challenge. And uh, then when they saw that I was willing to work through it. It was, I just felt like I accomplished more when mm -hmm. they would tell me that this, you're not going to get this pony around. She's going to keep dumping you. And, and I fell off almost every lesson because she, she knew how to, to dump it. You know, she knew how to drop her shoulder and ponies know a lot more tricks than the horses. The horses I started on, they were quite easy. But then when they saw I was willing to work through that and I, uh, they started giving me ponies and horses to break. They raised ponies and they had a breeding stable also and all the Gladewinds ponies and they had other people send them horses and ponies and when I was 11 or 12 they they kind of hired me to I didn't get paid in exchange for riding they bought me my first saddle and my first riding boots and the Kramers were like second parents to me yeah. so I was so excited to have a job working with breaking the ponies and I ended up getting to show a lot of their ponies and I rode did a lot of catch riding from 12 years old on for different people and 
I wrote for Bibby Farmer and they would, the Kramers would pay for clinics with different top professionals when I was a kid on their ponies. So I got a lot of nice training through them and uh, Karen Harden helped me, but it, they were very supportive and they saw how much I wanted to do it. And they always wanted their own children to really have the passion and they all liked riding, but they didn't want to do it as badly as I did. I was like kind of obsessed, <laughs> but uh, I loved it. Where do you find the, the drive and the motivation every day, you know, every day? I, I don't, I don't really think of it as, as having to have a lot of drive. I love doing it. It's something I look forward to. Even, even now it's been kind of nice with the break. My husband and I have been able to go out and he hasn't ridden for over 20 something years. And we go out to the stable and he's been trail riding with me and Dekas is a saint. So he, he walks around on him. He does a little bit of trotting. Um, I, I guess it was something that was so difficult when I was young to be able to do and I had to work so hard to do it. Then now it's just a pleasure to have some nicer horses. I, I, when I started, I got every horse that nobody else wanted to ride. And they'd say, oh, we'll ask Margie to ride. She'll ride anything. <laughs> and Mrs. Kramer used to tease me. She said, if I, I brought a donkey out here, you'd probably get on it. Did that follow you? Um, because you've got many riders that, that uh, become successful or often ride a type of horse. Another type follows them throughout their entire career. Was it the same for you? No, I had all different types. I, I actually was probably best on the little bit hotter. I rode a lot of hunters. I rode a lot of hunters and did the equitation also. And I always wanted to do the jumpers, but I did a lot of hunters and, and um, mainly a lot of thoroughbreds when I started. And, and as a type, I like the ones that were a little more sensitive, a little more blood. But, you know, you, you can't be picky when you – I never owned any part of my own horse till I was well into my middle 20s. So I was happy with anything I got to ride. So I didn't really have a type. I, I had to learn to adapt to what the horses were. So I, I rode everything from stubborn ornery ponies to hot race horses off the racetrack to, I got a lot of experience riding different horses and, and just kind of gained experience that way. And, and they taught me a, a lot. Uh, these days we know you with, with your fantastic Royce uh, and of course with Dikas, uh, who's now a loyal partner to your, uh, to your husband, Steve. Um, we we yeah. hope to see, uh, to see Dikas back, back out on the, on the show, yeah. of course. Um, where, where do they fit in, in the spectrum of horses? Are they similar? Are they different? Um, because they seem huge. Well, it's funny. Royce looks huge, but he's just a big boned horse. I, I kind of compare him to a football player. He's like, Uh, a strong football player. And Dekas is more like a basketball player. He's all legs and just really tall and lanky. Dekas is probably two hands taller than Royce is, but nobody, he's 18-1. Royce is probably only measures at the withers, probably about 16-1. So he looks a lot bigger than he is because he's so big bone. Yeah. He's not the type of horse I would normally pick out as something that, that I, neither one would be. I mean, Laurel, Hidden Creek's Laurel or, or a horse named Saluda I used to ride. That's really a type that's more around 16-2 and short couple. That would probably be a type that I would pick out. But you can't, nowadays, you know, kind of beggars can't be choosy. And you got to, I, I like both of them had a lot of talent. And and uh, and they both wanted to leave the jumps up and were careful. And, and you learn to adapt to their style a little bit. Um, every article that I could find about you, um whether it's um, a month old or it's 15 years old, in every article, um, you seem to be emphasizing the fact that um, you, you're still learning um, every day. Um, how, what, what did you learn in, in the past few months, uh, let's say after, when, the, when the corona break started? What, what did the horses teach you um, over the last few, uh, few weeks? You know, each horse you learn something different from because they all have different personalities. That's why this is a type of sport that you never get tired of. You're always learning something new, how to deal with. I've got three or four new eight-year-olds, and, and they're teaching me all the time what works with them, and you try and build a bond and a relationship. Uh, it's, it's nice to go back to the basics and be able to work with these horses instead of having to run off to a horse show and just get ready for that. We're able to work with them at home and build a good foundation, which is what we 
that's how I started with the horses. I've been able to, you know, and spend a lot of time. I have some babies at the barn and it's been really a lot of fun spending time with the, the weanlings and the yearlings. I mean, they're, they're like sponges. They just want to soak everything up and, and they're just fun to be around. You know, they're just, some of them, I have a couple of Royce's babies and um, they've got his personality, a little bit of a comedian and they love the tension. They, they'll come running over they, they listen better than most dogs. You know, I call them and they come running up and want to be scratched on their withers or it's just fun being around them. But I, I think it's just learning to be patient and taking your time. And, and sometimes more time at the beginning is, is shorter time later when you're working with them and you build a good foundation. Um, Margie, you've, um, you've, you've competed in um, many championships, many Nations Cups. You've won many Nations Cups with, uh, with the American Equestrian team. Um, and now in recent years, you've been competing on the Global Champions League. A completely new concept, innovative, uh, uh, different rules, different strategies. Um, how do you like the change? I love it. I mean, it's, it's great to be able to go to all these new venues and and see all the different places. And now people that we competed against in Nations Cups, we get to ride with. And uh, it's great seeing how all the top riders, how they work and you get to go to nice five-star shows with the top riders and, and you never stop learning. You know, I, as a little kid, I learned a lot by watching at the rail and and soaked up as much as I could. And no, no matter what age you are, you're still always learning. And it's it's fun watching all the top riders and even the younger ones. I mean. You can pick something up from anyone and, and, and everyone. I mean, it's just, it's a very interesting sport in that way that I don't think we ever stop learning. Um, well, uh, I think you'll comment to our, our, in our in the saddle um, aspect about your, um, your big win uh, at the first stage, at least, or the first round of the Global Champions League in Valkenswaard, uh, a victory alongside Eric Lamas, um, an Olympic champion, uh, winner of many Grand Prix, just like you, um, an aclomp, accomplished uh, show jumper. How was it to team up with him? My first Nations Cups were always in North America to start. So I've been competing against him for a long time and also in the Winter Equestrian Festival in Toronto and all those shows. And it's kind of nice to be able to team up and, and do a championship together with him. He's always been very competitive and he's always fast. And it was, it was a new experience and it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, you see, you you, uh, you learned a lot by by watching from the rail. Who were your inspirations? Oh gosh, I I couldn't name just one. But as a kid, I, I think one of the most interesting riders that I watched. It's it's more because I was in America, so it was Rodney Jenkins was amazing to watch because he was he was maybe not the stylist that some of the others are, but he was he never interfered with the horses. He always was a real horseman, and he the horses all seemed to love him, and he was totally out of their way when they jumped. And I think horses like that to have their own freedom over the fence. He, I would watch him, he would jog up with idle dice to this big, tall vertical, nothing underneath. It would be probably five and a half, six feet and just jog up at a little sit trot and the horse would curl around it. And he was just amazing. You get on one horse after the next. I mean, then you had your classic stylists like Michael Matz and Joe Farges, Conrad, Katie Perdon. I mean, those are all people I want. Ian Miller. I mean, Ian's been amazing for decades and decades, and he stays as fit and, and rides as well as he ever has. Um, I watched him year after year, and he was amazing what he did with the horses, just watching him in the schooling area with the different gymnastic type exercises, but he would do like tight combinations where he had a lot of big horses because he's a big man. And I remember with Big Ben watching him school over these tight vertical, vertical combinations and getting the horse to react quickly and, and think for themselves a little bit. Because I think in the long run, if you get them thinking for themselves, they're going to help you out more when you need them to. Uh, are you um, the, 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 the kind of horse trainer, if I may say, put it like that, that doesn't, uh, doesn't want to program uh, a horse? Or, or, and is that maybe even more the American style compared to the European style? I don't, I think I'm somewhere in between the American style and the European style. I think because of my size, I have to do different things. I, I do sit down more for leverage than the American. I'm not as much in the two point as a lot of riders in the U.S. because I need to get more leverage because of my height. So I have to sit down and it helps with that. And I can get the horses to engage more behind that way. And I have, I do a lot of dressage background so that, that gets me more sitting in the saddle and trying to get the horses to engage. 
Um, I don't know that I put every horse in the same program. I, I try and do what's best, what they seem to like the best. When you ride a thoroughbred hot horse, you have to ride them differently than you do a big, cold, warm blood. So you have to adapt to their style sometimes also. I mean, if I was, when I started, like I said, I was, I was doing 60, 70 rounds between hunters and jumpers as a kid down in Tropical Park and the fairgrounds. And um, I would just get on one to the next. And a lot of them were patch rides. So I didn't get to have them adapt to me. I had to adapt to them very quickly. They were horses that I rode for different trainers. So I had like five, 10 minutes to adapt to how they went best and what they liked best. You, you speak there about, about heroes or at least people that you looked up to or that maybe have influenced you. Um, do you think that Margie Engel influences people? I don't know. <laughs> It's a funny question. I, I mean, I know as a kid, like I looked up to Bill Steinkraus. He, I, and I think besides just being a top rider, when I watched all his old videos and read the books and everything, I think one of the nicest things about him is besides being a, a top rider is he was a very classy man. And he, he was always kind to everyone. He was always polite. He had integrity. Um, Those are things I think growing up in a non-horsey family, I, I really admire in someone is how they treat other people. And, and a lot of people can ride well, but it's how you treat the horses and how you treat other people. I think that's, an, it's very important also. So I hope it's not just by the riding, it's how you act towards other people and how you are as a person that, that people try and emulate. And I, and I think that's more something I, I looked up to also when I was a kid, that some of these top riders, no matter how good they rode, and, and it's just like with Rod, they still had time to say hello to you. They, they weren't arrogant. They were very, very humble, and, and they had time to give you advice if you wanted. You know, they treated everyone the same, and, and, and that's what I, I really liked about them. I, I admired how they were as people, not just as riders. I, 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 do, I think it's very fair to say um, that many, um, at least of your colleagues, um, will, if, if they don't admire you for the, or was it nearly 250 Grand Prix wins, at least they will admire you for your personality. Because everything you, you just described um, about, for example, Steinkraus, I think it just perfectly fits into your profile just as well. Yeah. Well, that's very kind of you. But I, I, mean, I, I do try and do have a light manner and, and it is, You know, laughing is the best medicine. The sport has a lot of ups and downs. So you've got to kind of laugh at yourself. I'm the first one that's ready to laugh at yourself if something goes wrong, which it does a lot. And um, you got to learn to roll with the punches. And sometimes uh, laughter, like they say, is the best medicine. And I, I like to joke around a little bit. It breaks the tension. And uh, just it's much easier to be happy than the other way around. If, if you have a, a long-lasting career like you have yourself, Um, you go through uh, through all the, the ups and downs. Is the um, the idea of not taking yourself all too serious is that the best way to 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 keep it rolling as long as you've kept it rolling so far? I think so, but I, I I've, that's still something I'm working on. I mean, you you do as much as you try and work on it, and it, no matter what age, you still tend to think about all the negative things that, that have happened to you, and when you make mistakes in the ring. And it's something that it's better to try and get something positive out of, it, out of it and try and learn from your mistakes and not dwell on them. And that's still something I have to work on a little bit at night. You know, when you go, you kind of go over it. Oh, I should have done this or I should have done that. And, and you beat yourself up quite a bit. But you have to, to learn to kind of just learn and go forward. Yeah. Is, is that um, if, if you had advice, is that advice to give to, to young people? Um, who come into the sport and, and who are working hard and finding um, that there are serious hurdles in front of the goals that they want to achieve? I, I, that's one of the things. I mean, I, there's going to be hurdles in, in everything you do, but you got to just work through them and try and learn from them and be positive and, and just be very determined, never give up. I mean, it was, it was funny that my first instructor, that was one thing she said. She said, take the word can't out of your vocabulary. And I always remember that. And she always, she said, You just have to learn a way around it. Like you said, they're hurdles. So how am I going to get around this? But you have to work away. I had, I had a student and I did the same thing when I taught a lot of the students, you know, when I teach them, I'll work with you, but don't, don't use the word can't, you know, you can learn, learn to work around that. And I don't, even if they have disabilities and things and, and they would work around them. 
But if you want to do it, you know, whatever you want to do, and if you have, you have a passion for it, you try and do it as best you can. That's, that sounds like very good advice um, that everybody can, uh, can use, whether you're a show jumper or not, regardless um, of what you do in life. But uh, we are talking about show jumping, and you brought us um, some tips and tricks. Um, the first um, exercise that you gave us, um, we've got two ground reels, uh, 60 feet in between. I had to look it up on the online calculator. That is uh, 18 and a half meters um, between each other. Um, very basic. What do we do with it? It's a very simple exercise, and I just put the two rails out. You can make them a little longer if you want. And in a smaller ring, it, it works well at that distance. And I just try and get my riders to, to work with. And I do the same thing to work on the horse's adjustability. It's Usually it's five comfortable strides if you're not going very strong. And just working on straightness, it's just very simple and basic. Working on going straight. And before the turn, not letting your horses cut in or not letting them bulge out, keeping nice tracks and alternating turns on the landing side. And you practice it at five strides, then collect at a stride in six. And if you're more advanced, you can add to seven strides and then leave out and do a four strides down it and always keeping that connection with the leg and hand. So you have kind of feel the horse underneath you. You have to mold yourself. I tell a lot of the riders, mold yourself around the horses so you feel what's going on underneath, not always looking down at, at what they're doing but just alternating anywhere between four and seven strides and alternating it and trying to make each stride even. I mean, that's the main thing and just getting yourself adjustable and the horse. And it helps when you do courses because the courses now are very technical. You have a lot, of, a lot of lines that are forward and then you have to get the horses to come back right away. And it's just teaching your, yourself to be adjustable and your horse to be responsive. Okay. Um, that's the, let's call it the warm up exercise. Then, um, as a second one, um, we've got, I think it's drop balls. Uh, what, what is this? I use, I use raised cavalettis mm -hmm. and they're about four feet apart, which I'm not sure what that is in meters, but probably one, one, one twenty something, one meter 20. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll believe you. So, uh, and I have them on opposed opposite sides. And usually I have like little boxes that I have at home, but they're, you can put them anywhere from six inches to, to, I think it goes up to 14 or 16 inches to, by rolling them over and alternating sides kind of on the ground on one side and up to 12 or 16 inches on the side. And it's almost, and you have the horses trot through those and it's kind of a exercise. I like to, compare it to the football players when they run through the tires and it's kind of agility and their coordination and it works on the horse's coordination and you can really feel the suspension in the horses and you know if you have your horse too too heavy on its front end then it's not going to be able to trot through there correctly or, or if you don't have enough trot from behind enough impulsion then they get they get very plain and they kind of stumble through if you have the impulsion behind and then you get you can feel the horses elevate and that's what you want is to feel their hind end active underneath you. And it's a really good tool for gauging that. So I like that exercise too. And, and these are exercises that don't take, it's not a lot of wear and tear on the horses. They're very easy exercises and there's not a lot of pounding on them. And they're things that you can feel what's going on underneath and making sure that you have your horse where you want it and working on the connection that you have with the horse. Um, talking about, about pounding, um, your horses, Last long. Indigo, 20 years young. Uh, Royce, 16, still going strong. Dikas is, a, is a, at the start of his big career, but your horses last long. Do, do you attribute that to, um, to your training program or, or what, what's, what's the story behind it? A little bit of everything. I do a lot of preventative maintenance and I'm lucky enough to have my husband that helps kind of see things before they happen and he, he cautions me if there's any little thing coming up and we try and stop it ahead of time. You can't eliminate everything. There's going to be injuries and things, but I, I've been very lucky with, with that and trying to have the best group of people around you that you can and the best team of vets and blacksmiths. And it's really a team effort with everyone working and the grooms, you know, knowing if something's not just right and then you just back off. And I, I feel like you're always safer to, to back off and, and skip a show than to try and go when they're not right yeah. uh, and then have an injury that you regretted going to the show and getting one more class in. 
Um, Perrin went, he was a big horse and he was club footed and, and he, when we first vetted him, they didn't think he was going to last for very long because of his build and everything. And he was, and he went, I think he won his last Grand Prix, he was 19 or 20. Yeah. And uh, so it's just, I think a lot of it's just maintenance and not overdoing. And I've been very fortunate to have, in the earlier part of the career, I had a lot of different Grand Prix horses, so I could alternate them a lot. Um, if, if it happens with one horse, it could be luck. If it happens <laughs> with, uh, with n numerous horses, it can't just be luck. It also has to be the system and, and, or the program or the management. And in that management, you've got a third exercise for us. Um, uh, before we, we recorded it, you said, yeah, this is also one of those exercises to um, not give the horses. I, I, I won't explain it. I'll let you explain it. What have we got okay. here? Bounces. bounces. I, I love bounces. It gets the horses, uh, works on their core, and it gets them thinking about jumping off their hind end on their own. If they get in, I, I let them figure it out on their own pretty much. You can canter through any probably about a meter 20 in between. I think I got that right. I'm not sure, <laughs> but four feet. And uh, I, you can put anywhere from two to six bounces up in a row, whatever you like. And it teaches the horses to rock back on their own. You don't have to jump them very big. I only jump them normally. It's normally less than a meter. Like, I don't know what two foot is, but, but uh, probably like two foot, you can do them with X's. You can, I, do them with straight poles a lot of times. And it just makes the horse think about rocking back and jumping off his haunches. And it's a good exercise for them building their core without having the pounding of landing off a of large jumps. And it helps keep their, their muscles strong for jumping without doing a, a lot of big jumps at home. I try and keep the jumps to a minimum at home. I was always taught horses only have so many jumps in them. So I try and save as much as I can for the ring. And uh, that way it's, it's less pounding on them. And the exercises with the canter rails for the students that need to practice using their eye and seeing a distance, that's a good exercise for that. So I, it's, it's that same instance where less is more, you know, the less pounding you can do with keeping them fit enough so they don't get injured. I think that helps them a lot. And, and it's an exercise where they can learn on their own too, and not always depend on the rider to, to help balance them all the time. Yeah. So they can balance themselves off of the bounce. And, and I just, I just really like that exercise. I've done it for quite a few years. <laughs> all right. Um, thank you very much for all three. I think um, uh, all of our fans, regardless of their level, they can find something in one of these, uh, these three exercises. And I think everybody who has watched uh, this episode of the inside of at home can do something with the idea Take the word can't out of your sentences and your vocabulary and it'll take you uh, quite a long way. One, one thing I was with the, with the bounces, I, when, I was, when I did do that exercise, one of the things I've been fortunate, I went to a lot of the vet conventions with my husband mm -hmm. and there are other vets that have conditioning of the sport horses and with the bounces, that's why I've always kept that in the back of my head. She even told different dressage horses and, and dressage riders that was a good exercise for building their core and strength so they don't get injured. So it was something that, you know, you read different books like conditioning of the sport horse and things like that. So it, like you said, for all horses, it's not always just for jumpers. It does help strengthen their muscles. There's a second time, I think, in this interview that you say, um, I read it in a book, um, though <laughs> I believe that you've got a lot of natural talent um, and everybody will agree. Um, do, did you pick up a lot from reading books? I did. I, anywhere I could learn, I, I tried to learn. I read Many times, Hunt Seed Equitation that George had written and built books of Bill Steinkraus. And I'm fortunate enough to, like I said, be able to go to the vet conventions with my husband. And I'm not into the gory stuff with the all the surgeries and things like that. But I did like, I, I was interested in like that conditioning of a sport horse. That was, I went to a lot of the lectures with that was interesting. And I bought some of the books that, that the people that I like to listen to. So it's helped me with with the maintaining the horses and, and with some of the things that go on down back at the barn and, and just, you know, the more you can know about the horses, I think the better all around. I couldn't agree more. Um, Margie, thank you very much um, for sitting down with us. I know it's, uh, it's midday in, uh, in Florida. I know your day isn't over yet. So uh, we'll let you go back to the barn and, uh, and back to work. But I, uh, I want to thank you for uh, taking the time and giving us some good insights and some, uh, some very good advice. Uh, based on experience. So uh, thank you very much. No problem. Enjoy being here. And uh, 
it's nice to get out of the heat anyway. <laughs> it's the middle of the day. And uh, we, we're not traveling much anyway. I was teasing someone the other day. I said, I told my suitcases, we're not going anything. We're not going anywhere for a while. And now I'm dealing with all this uh, emotional baggage. So <laughs> there, Money, we're, not, we're I, not doing that much. So I, we can have plenty of time for this. I can't wait until the tour starts again and we, we finally have you uh, back at the shows again. So thank you, uh, you for sitting down with us. Um, and to you at home, to our viewers, our fans of The Insider, The Insider at Home, or in the side, all the 20 questions. Once again, as always, thank you very much for watching. Stay safe. Bye-bye. See you next time.